that was very kind words, Armin. Thank you. I think the tears welled up in my eyes when you said that. Thank you. Blind faith, and the text is Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Amen. And thanks be to God for his word. Our story begins when Jesus and his disciples came into the city of Jericho. Jericho, that ancient city, lays claim to be one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. It lies 15 miles east of Jerusalem, just above the northern shore of the the Dead Sea. It was a place where travelers crossed over the Jordan River from the east to get back into Israel. And did you notice our text says that as Jesus and his disciples started to depart from Jericho, they weren't alone. It says they were together with a large crowd leaving the city. Now why does Mark tell us that? Why should he mention a large crowd? Well, Jericho was on the pilgrimage route up to Jerusalem, up to the temple, and from what we know in the next chapter, chapter 11, the Passover festival was approaching. So in all likelihood, this crowd of pilgrims on their way, they were on their way to Jerusalem for Passover. Every male Hebrew over the age of 12 living within a 15 to 20 mile radius around Jerusalem was expected to attend. And so in all likelihood, this large crowd was just part of this this gathering throng of Jewish pilgrims coming from all directions to celebrate the memory in Jerusalem of how God liberated his people from slavery in Egypt and gave his law and his promised land to the children of Israel. And I think it's that fact that explains the presence of one Bartimaeus sitting by the roadside begging. Irene and I often do shopping. We like to go down to the Danforth. That's a cool part of town. And the way we go takes us down the Bayview Extension and then up the Pottery Road to the Danforth. And it's there at that intersection of Pottery Road and Bayview that we encounter an older gentleman sitting in a chair on the northeast corner of that intersection. There he sits out in the open begging for money. He's there almost every time we go that direction. It's not much, but it must be a fairly good location to beg for that poor soul because he's almost always there. And every time I see that guy, it reminds me of this story. A man named Bartimaeus is also sitting beside the road, begging on this pilgrim route up to Jerusalem, 
And it must have been a pretty good location to beg from with these spiritually minded travelers passing by. Of course, Bartimaeus is blind. And since there is no CNIB in the, in the ancient world, there was no social assistance from the government, blindness almost always entailed poverty. So Bartimaeus is both blind and poor. Symbolically, he lacks both the sight and resources. Sitting beside the road, he is, he is literally sidelined and marginalized, an outsider, a bystander on the road of life. Well, according to the parallel uh, story in Luke's gospel, when, we, when, when he heard all of this commotion going on beside his regular begging spot, he asked what was going on. And somebody in the crowd tells him, Jesus of Nazareth is in the neighborhood passing by. Now, apparently, Bartimaeus has heard of this Jesus of Nazareth because he starts crying out, hoping that this man could somehow relieve him of his darkness and his poverty. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, friends, here's the first lesson I want us to learn about being a, a disciple. To follow Jesus means that we have to honestly admit that however much we may know about certain matters, however much expertise we may claim to have in many fields, when it comes to the profoundest issue of life, we're as blind and as lost as Bartimaeus. We too stand in need of God's mercy. That's the testimony of scripture. It's the testimony of our own experience if we're honest enough to admit it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's how we come to God, lost and blind and in need of God's saving help. So Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus as best he knows how. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now he doesn't have a full understanding of who Jesus is just yet. He doesn't cry out son of God or savior or Lord. Any of those terms would mean he had recognized the deity of the incarnate one, but instead he calls him son of David a messianic title from the Old Testament. Ever since the promise back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that God would raise up an offspring from David and would establish the throne of his kingdom forever, pious Israelites had waited for a descendant of David to come as their Messiah. And somehow, despite his blindness, in his desperation, Bartimaeus trusts that Jesus is God's Messiah, a unique man sent from God to liberate the oppressed, to vindicate the, vic the, the victimized, and maybe even to grant sight for the blind, just as Isaiah had prophesied Messiah would do. He hasn't yet grasped that this Messiah is also Emmanuel, God with us, of course, the disciples hadn't grasped that fact either just yet. So Bartimaeus makes no theologically definitive confession of faith. He simply cries out with as much knowledge and faith as he can, Jesus, help! <laughs> so friends, we should note then that being a Christ follower does not begin after we've achieved a certain theological sophistication or have reached a certain higher level of Bible knowledge or of maturity regarding God and spiritual things. No, discipleship begins the moment we recognize the confusion and poverty in our lives and we cry out to God for help. Discipleship begins before we can hang the correct theological labels on Jesus, often a long time. Our friend and my colleague, Victor Shepard, 
has written this in one of his sermons. Discipleship in truth is much simpler than most people imagine. It's simpler because our slightest admission of our own need and of Christ's availability will render us disciples in the making. But as soon as blind Bartimaeus cries out, Jesus, help! Some folk in the crowd tell him to pipe down. Verse 48 says, Many of the people scolded him and told him to be quiet. Now why do you think they did that? Why were at least some people in the crowd trying to shut Bartimaeus up? Here he is shouting out for help and people start to rebuke him and tell him to be quiet. But Bartimaeus just cranks up the volume and repeats his appeal to Jesus even more loudly. Now maybe, maybe some of the people in the crowd are anxious for Jesus. Maybe they want to prevent the trouble that Jesus might get into if the authorities overhear these these messianic acclamations, calling him things like son of David. Remember, Jesus has been in severe conflict with the religious leaders, and now they're looking for any excuse to put an end to Jesus and his ministry. That's one reason. Or perhaps... Perhaps they tell Bartimaeus to shut up because they're embarrassed by this blind beggar's unruly, unseemly behavior. And aren't we often guilty of the same thing? In the presence of someone who is disabled or a person who is extremely different from us, those people who can make us feel uncomfortable and awkward... We don't know what to do. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to respond to people like that. So it's better that they're just not seen or heard from, out of sight, out of mind. And it makes it easier on us to keep things in control. But of course, God doesn't judge like many of us do. As the verse of scripture puts it, we human beings so often focus on the the outward appearance, but God looks... Where? On the inside, on the heart of the person, on their genuine intent. And because the heart of God is always responds to a sincere cry for mercy and help. Look what the text says Jesus did. It says, Jesus stopped. As James Edwards writes in his commentary, on these words hangs the fate of Bartimaeus. The original Greek reads, and literally, and Jesus stood still. How remarkable it is that the Son of Man allows the cries of one poor powerless person to stop him in his tracks. And in that moment, some of the people in the crowd see Jesus stop. They must have sensed his intent. So they cry out, hey, Bartimaeus, it's your lucky day. Get up. He's calling for you to come to him. Mark includes a fascinating detail in verse 50. He says, throwing his cloak aside, Bartimaeus jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. The cloak he threw aside was his outer garment, in Greek, hemation, an outer robe that the ancient Hebrews would wear over an inner nightshirt-like garment. It was the only night covering that a poor person had, which is why the Old Testament law commanded that it could never be taken or confiscated from anyone. It was literally, in a cold night, the difference between life and death. Well, apparently he was using this cloak spread out on the ground in front of him to receive alms, donations of pocket change from the passing pilgrims. You see that sometimes at at the the entrance to TTC stations or in front of some Tim Hortons. They They put their jacket out and in go the coins. But the fact that Bartimaeus can toss his cloak aside and springs to his feet at once makes you sense just how eager he is to get to Jesus. But it also implies something else. 
Because you see, if his occupation, his job is begging, and generous people are putting their offerings in his cloak, then tossing aside his cloak represents leaving behind the symbol of his occupation. Just like James and John's left their fishing nets. Just like Matthew left his tax tables. Like others who are called by Jesus, he abandons everything he has. Maybe leaving his cloak symbolizes abandoning what hinders his approach to Jesus. And it's ironic, isn't it, that the one who has, who has next to nothing finds it easier to do this than the one who has many possessions, like the rich young ruler that you read about earlier in this very chapter. Now, friends, don't get too nervous. This does not mean that to follow Jesus means we all have to abandon our present careers and effectively give away our wealth, although it might. In the congregation I formerly served at Knox Church, where Artin and I were together, at Harvard and Spadina, we had some of our members who literally did that. And now they're helping AIDS patients in Tanzania. They're witnessing to their faith in Varanasi, India. They're helping refugees get settled in Budapest, Hungary. They're helping plant churches in rural Mexico. Not all of us have to do things like that, of course. But surely the call is laid upon us to follow Jesus. And that is teaching us to travel light, to not let our material possessions possess us and to view whatever vocation or job or position we find ourselves in as a means to the greater end of serving Christ and embodying his values and living out a kingdom of God lifestyle where we are. Not our money, not our careers, not our possessions, but Jesus is the formative, the formative, determinative center of a disciple's life. So the man comes to Jesus, and what does Jesus ask him? Wow. Look at verse 51. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Now, does that question sound at all familiar if you know your Bibles? You know, back in verse 35 of that same chapter, Mark chapter 10, two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, came to Jesus asking him for the glory of sitting beside Jesus when one day he'd be ruling the world, asking for the cabinet posts. He, they want the positions of prestige and power to be in the new administration in the kingdom. As it says, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, there's something we want you to do for us. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked them. It's the very same question. But Bartimaeus responds differently. Whereas James and John are asking for extraordinary glory, Bartimaeus asks only for ordinary health. Now surely Bartimaeus' need must have been obvious to Jesus. The simplest, most practical response would have been for Jesus to quickly, silently heal Bartimaeus and keep moving because he's got more weighty responsibilities. He's, he's on his way to Jerusalem, for goodness sake. But no. For Jesus, Bartimaeus is not a problem to be dealt with, but a person to be treated with dignity and with respect. To use the language of Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher, Jesus treats Bartimaeus not as an it, but as a thou, a fellow human being made in God's image. And Jesus I think, shows this by asking him a question, giving Bartimaeus the dignity of expressing himself as a person, of giving an answer in his own voice, rather than treating him as a problem to be solved or a voiceless victim 
Jesus asks and then listens intently to the man's answer. Teacher, he says, I want to see again. In humble trust, Bartimaeus doesn't ask for wealth or power or status, but only for sight. He asks not for what is superhuman, but simply human. For those of us who are healthy and well, normalcy, being able to see, may seem like the bare minimum. But for those who are ill and troubled, normalcy, being able to see, is God's greatest gift. And Jesus declares, go, your faith has made you well. The word for healing there, that word for saved, healing, is the very same word in Greek. Salvation, sozo, can have physical and spiritual dimensions. And how appropriate that word is, because look at how Bartimaeus responds in verse 52. It says, he received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road, up toward Jerusalem, where Jesus is now bound. See, here's a picture of a model disciple as opposed to James and John. In the span of a few moments, Jesus has transformed Bartimaeus from a beggar beside the road to a disciple on the road with Jesus. Bartimaeus was a nobody on the road of life who took the initiative to cry out to Jesus in his time of need, and he demonstrated his faith by the title by which he names Jesus, son of David, showing that however imperfectly he he knew who Jesus really was. By his persistence, he didn't let the opportunity pass by. And by his request for healing, showing he believed that Jesus had the power and authority from God. And how does Jesus respond to this nobody on the road? He gives Bartimaeus recognition by stopping and listening to his request. Jesus gives him restoration, restoring Bartimaeus to a productive life, bringing back his sight. And Jesus gives him a new purpose to become a disciple, to follow Jesus on the road of life. In my preaching classes, I always tell the students, Toward this point of the sermon, you're supposed to ask internally, if not externally, so what? Rev Kev, that's a great history lesson. I've learned a lot more about the Bible today. Well, that's a great message. So what? What does this passage have to say for you and me right now and who we are in our lives and as a community at Tyndale? Now, maybe this morning some of you feel like Bartimaeus. At the beginning, not physically blind, but but you do feel kind of sidelined, marginalized, trapped by your circumstances, a bystander on the road of life and not going anywhere very fast. Do those words describe how you feel here at work (laughs) or at home? Or those of you who are in school? Do they describe your health? your career path, your marriage, your relationship with the Lord? What do you want me to do for you? That's the very question Jesus asks to you and to me today. Let me encourage you to do what Bartimaeus did. Take the initiative. Don't let the sun go down tonight before you bow down and without hesitation cry out to Jesus In trusting faith, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I think this passage is speaking to all of us this morning. And we're gathered here as a Christian community, but I want us to remind her, this passage has powerful evangelistic implications. Because if you've never committed your life to Christ as his follower, tell him you want to follow him, you want to be a Christian. Acknowledge that your sin has separated you from God and that Jesus died on the cross for you and ask Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord. And the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
And on the authority of God's word, he promises to work in your life just as he did long ago on that Jericho road to recognize you and restore you and give you a new purpose. What about the rest of us? What does this passage say to us who are already believers, who know Christ? If you're already a Christian, let me ask you something. If Jesus came up these steps into this chapel this morning, as I think in his word and spirit he does through every sermon, (laughs) and then he asks, what do you want me to do for you? What would you say? What does... What do you want Jesus to do for you? Now, sisters and brothers, please do not be overly humble or self-effacing at this point. Oh, nothing, Lord, I'm just fine. You go deal with people who have, you know, bigger problems than I do. You go take care of Kevin and Armin and those kind of guys. Um, Oh, nothing, Lord, I'm just fine, thanks. It may be a sign of our spiritual lethargy or of our immaturity, or even our pride, if we aren't able to formulate a response to Jesus' question. What do you want me to do for you, asks Jesus. Maybe a sign we were trying to live the Christian life in our own strength, or we have forgotten how to depend on the Lord for the things most important to us, how to identify the deep needs that only he can satisfy. If you can't readily answer his question, what do you want me to do for you? I urge you to take some time this week with Jesus to ponder that question. What area of life, what issue, what question, what need, what fear, what opportunity is the Lord asking you to bring to him? And don't stop pondering and praying and wrestling about this until the Lord has given you an answer. May the Lord help all of us to demonstrate persistent faith like Bartimaeus, trusting Jesus to be our savior and sharing with him our deepest hopes and fears and needs. Almighty and loving God, we bless you for the gift of your word and we pray now for the grace to believe what we have heard and to live in ways that honor you above all through Christ our Lord. Amen.